Of all the hand-drawn bars in all of Carport City, she had to walk into mine. Unlike her, though, this old dive weren't much to look at. The decor was so antique, I was considering getting it valued, and clientele who weren't much livelier. We had all the regulars in this evening. There was Carlo and Hal, over in the corner, ears glued to an old wire which turned up so loud that it hissed like a cobra. Had a Yankee accumulated down on the GGs, like they did every Friday night. This one would be their ticket out of here. Then there was Harry Ong, a more fitting name I ain't never come across in all my years behind this bar. Hair as white as New York snow, and a face more wrinkled than a walnut. He was always beating his guns to whichever unfortunate soul he could snare, telling all about his so-called glorious career, shifting moonshine for Capone's mob over in Windy City. Not that any of us believed him, or stayed awake long enough to hear the whole yarn. This evening though, it was he who was conked out over his drink still managing to get under everyone's skin with his snoring. And finally, there was little Jimmy Chan, practicing his tricks and spilling cards all over my corrugated floorboards. Said he'd gotten an agent who booked him a gig over in Sin City next month. If you ask me, his act needed a lot of polishing between now and then. Most things in this joint did. But not her though. She shone like a sliver of moonlight in an autumn evening as she pushed through the sellotape top door and sashayed up to the bar. Moved like a prowling cougar on the hunt, she did. And by the look on her face, she was on the lookout for fresh meat. I guess my luck was in that evening. She must have liked what she saw, because she took less than a second to scan over the list, then ordered a sea breeze. She never took her eyes off me as I crushed the ice and poured the gin. Say where, I said. And when the tumbler was almost full, she did. Go easy on the cranberry, she instructed. Most people drink to forget, she mused, as I balanced a slice of lime on the rim of the highball glass. Not me. I drink for nights to remember. That was her only proper cocktail glass. I drawn it myself with a ruler to get it just right. It was ordinarily reserved for one of the city's big cheeses. He popped in every other Sunday to iron out his latest scam with the latest dawn. But this was no ordinary lady. I have a proposal for you, mister. She purred, as she stretched a slender hand toward me to straighten my tie. She let her hand linger on my chest a little longer than was strictly necessary. I've heard a lot about you. She lied, but the flattery was redundant anyway. She'd had me a good evening. I lit her a fresh smoke with my favorite chrome lighter, and after taking a long drag and exhaling in my face, she explained how she needed a man for a job. In essence, I was to be the driver. This time she wasn't fibbing when she said Bob the Gun had pointed her my way. Told her I knew my way around the steering wheel. I used to make up the numbers at the Indy 500, I told her modestly. But I knew she would have been informed about my rather successful career. Why'd you quit? She asked. So I recounted the abridged version my run-in with the mob there. Let's just say, I made one too many enemies. Let me assure you, mister, that if you're in cahoots with me, you'll be making friends in very high places. It wasn't friends I was after. Truth be told, even without her gorgeous eyes and pretty face, I'd have signed up for the job. I needed the cash. This joint was a one-way ticket to Brokeville. And the only reason I hadn't upped and left already was that my feet were stapled to the floor. I shook the dame's slender hand once, and the deal was struck. I was happy to play the pushover. This would be my last job. A retirement guarantee. Either to a comfortable semi-detached in Indy, or to a home up in the clouds. I wasn't too fussed, which. And that was when the door swung open, and three suits marched in armed from hat to toe cap and not trying to conceal it. After scanning the room from left to right to check their target was present, they opened fire, Tommy spraying the room like a sprinkler on a spring lawn. It was bedlam. Rows of bottles smashed into a million pieces, decorating the room like a bedlam. 
Then, one of them must have hit the light, because everything went black. I could make out the sound of another piece returning fire. Like our friendly guests, someone in here had clearly flaunted the no arms policy I was so keen on. And then, as quickly as it had all begun, it all went quiet. From my shelter behind the counter, I could clearly hear three people groaning. But who was hit? And who do these mobsters have a contract on in the first place?